Dean, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for making time for this between your uh, practice and uh, practicing Dead Space. <laughs> no, 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 no. We can't start off by claiming that I play Dead Space. No, no, no. I was, I was watching and getting scared of footage of a new Dead Space remake. I, I was just practicing though, um, and I have the stench of our jam space coated in my skin. Um, I haven't had a chance to take a shower yet. We jam underneath of a auto body shop, and I think that they like spill chemicals and shit like that into the floor, and it just makes. You go in there and your skin just reeks when you leave. So it's a it's an awful environment. That doesn't sound very healthy, but that's the glamorous life of Archspire. I mean, I wonder sometimes, and maybe you have some insight as well, because I it's something I often think about with musicians. Is having a really awful place that you write music in good or bad? Because it's it could be good in the terms of Let's get out of here as soon as we can. Let's write something cool. We're suffering. I don't know if that's a thing that really matters in art, but people have said it does. But you guys write music together? What is this, the 80s? <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, we write. Well, we. I posted the other day on Instagram that uh, most of my best riffs are written with my pants off. And I do write a lot of riffs at home with my pants off. Um, but for the most part, when we have an idea, I'll bring it in. Uh, or Toby will bring in a riff, our other guitar player, and we'll all work on it together at the same time and tweak it and and change it, and it morphs into a thing that becomes um, whatever the hell kind of music we play. Well, I have a lot of questions, but first, I want to make sure we promote your European tour, which you just announced, with Psychroptic, Benighted, and Entheos. Am I leaving anyone off? Uh, no. Uh, it's going to be amazing. Those bands are all awesome, and... We haven't been to Europe in three and a half years, and so, come on, it's going to be so much fun. So, come on, Euros, don't miss out on this one. My first question, though, is the most important one of the night. Take as much time as you need to answer this one. Which is better, brutal technical death metal or technical brutal death metal? Techni oh, wait, I almost said, okay, wait, hold on. I know, it's hard to pick just one. I almost, I almost just answered immediately, but then <laughs> I stopped myself. I said, oh, wait. Okay, so, um, okay, so technical brutal death metal puts emphasis on the technicality with the brutality being secondary, correct? Correct. And then brutal technical like, like death metal. Like maybe Archspire would be technical brutal death metal, whereas maybe like guttural secrete might be brutal technical death metal. I, w I would pose to you that we are extreme technical death metal. Oh, okay. Yeah. No, yeah. no you're right. You're right. No, you're right. You're right. Some spawn of possession maybe is like technical brutal death metal uh, it's hard to say honestly like the <laughs> subgenre has gotten so i mean I, I don't know i mean the the band of the genre is necrophagist that's the band of the genre that's whether or not they're relevant as much now as they were back when you know 2001 2004 whatever the genre has changed um incorporating a lot of other uh subgenres there's a lot of incorporation of deathcore um a lot of incorporation of um of other things and it, and it's and it's going great uh but necrophagist is the the core the the absolute like distilled version of technical death metal and so i feel like if you have to use them as uh if you need a band to use as like your uh, whatever your guiding post of where to go from there, they're tech death. So we are in some respects faster. Uh, and so, and, and in some respects, a little bit more, like you said, a little bit more brutal, maybe some more kind of dumb guy riffs. I, I just love that you answered the question seriously. I thought you were just going <laughs> to laugh, but you answered it seriously, which is amazing. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, yeah. When you spend, um, it's your job. When you spend most of your time and like a good third or more of your life uh, laser focused on one thing and one thing only, you just you yeah. I mean, it's it's hard, man. It's that's all I that's all I thought about for the last for almost fourteen years. You know. Well, I gotta say, I know that you're gonna disagree with this <clears throat> because you have to. But um, I would say that, in my opinion, as somebody who's been listening to death metal for thirty years. Right. Um, I think Archspire is the new gold standard, even more than I mean, Necrophagist for sure, like raised the 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 bar for everybody for sure. But I think Necrophagist 
is the current gold standard. I think what you guys are doing is stuff that I didn't think would ever be physically possible. <laughs> well, um, yeah. Are you talking about how much our vocalist drinks after each show? Like how many beer is that what you're talking about? Like how, like, like, like what do you what physically possible? Like how quickly you can black out it? No, I'm just kidding. Um, the, uh, uh, that too, the stuff that we do, uh, as a band is, is definitely influenced by all of our favorite bands. We love origin. We love, uh, flesh God apocalypse. We love, uh, you know, cannibal corpse, dying fetus, uh, necrophagist, uh, the faceless, all these bands that basically we listened to when we first started. And all we're trying to do is just, is just take all that stuff and go like, how can we just make it a little bit faster and just, you know, and, and then also focus a, a bit more on, um, on making a very cohesive, catchy song more so than maybe some, uh, you know, uh, some other bands in, in the genre, not to say that that's good or bad because yeah. I, honestly, dude, uh, today and the, and yesterday, I've been listening to a lot of cattle decapitation, um, specifically monolith of inhumanity and that album, man, that's a disjointed album. The songs are not, they are, they are not polished, rounded off. Every part sinks nicely or slips nicely in the next section. It's disjointed, hard cuts, tempo changes. It's aggression. And man, it lends to this overall sense of this is a pissed off, right. grindy, disgusting death metal band. And man, it works. That's what ah. I liked about like the first Origin album, for example. It yes. sounds like they're just throwing the drums down a flight of stairs. It makes no sense. He's <laughs> yeah. just playing these weird like single stroke rolls and shit. It's so bizarre. And right. I've never heard anything like it before or since. Oh and, my God. You know, a, a lot of people think that I only like dumb pop music, which I do love pop, but I'm an extremist. I want it to be either origin, you know, arch spire, just like total insanity, or I want it to be Taylor Swift. One right. or the other. Do you, do you find that you are looking for a combination of the two ever? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay so one let or me, the other let, let me let me let me uh because you combine the two and then you get melodic death metal which i hate okay. i respect it but okay. like i wouldn't personally listen to it because to me it's like well pick one okay. is it death metal or is it melodic like is okay. it is it heavy or is it accessible pick one do you, you know you know what my favorite song uh recently has been this is this is might be weird i don't know i i love death metal my favorite song right now that's that's current and popular is Unholy by Sam Smith. Great song. Fuck, that's featuring a great song. Kim Petras. Okay, that is a great song. And and uh, my wife is actually going to uh, music school. She's finishing up her degree, and so she was her one of her professors was saying that the bridge in and the pre-chorus in modern music is disappearing. It is it is basically gone. TikTok I've is here. People say this taking over, right? So you listen to that song intro. Has a hook, verse, chorus, verse, chorus, songs over. Fuck, that's awesome. Dude, there's no I, fat, you know? I will say, though, that um, with Archspire, I think that you guys are, like, actually very catchy. You know, even though it is, like, obviously it is what it is. Like, it's crazy technical death metal. Yeah. But it's very catchy and musical without getting watered down, which seems like a very tricky needle to thread. That's why we take so long to write uh, music. Right now, we've been working on a new album for, well, we took we took maybe about nine or ten months off, and then we did a little bit of touring. And so, since uh, maybe we've done two months of writing, of like getting together, you know, we do three days a week, about two or three hours a day, um, and uh, we have a song, kind of, and uh, and maybe like two or three songs started that are kind of ideas. And it'll take us a good 14, 15 months of uninterrupted, like, writing. So wow. touring really, it really, like, we can't, we don't write on tour, uh, you know, and we try to write while everybody's there. But the, the thing is, man, the music takes so long because we just, we analyze every single riff and we go, you know what, if we are in a band and we're playing, in, still playing in five, 10 years from now, who knows? And I'm playing a riff that I don't like on stage every night. What am I doing? I need to like every single part. I need to like all the drum parts, all the vocal parts. We need to be like standing there totally like this is the music that we wrote. There's nothing in the music that I think 
ah, that riff got through. It's kind of shitty. It's not very <laughs> exciting, but whatever. I don't feel like that. So that's a big reason why it just takes so fucking long. So you were mentioning riffs, and obviously in this kind of music, guitars are the most important thing. But one of the things that I think is really different and special about Archspire is the vocals do not feel like phoned in death metal vocals that are just sort of this droning texture. Like there's like patterns and like they feel like they're polished and intentional in a way that most death metal vocals don't. We treat it like an instrument. So we go through a, a, a demoing phase. I appreciate that you said that. The, I, we go through a demoing phase of the vocals where we go, okay, the song's written more or less. Let's say it's 85% there skeleton wise. Um, Let's do vocal rhythms. So we demo all the vocal rhythms, gibberish words. You should hear the stupid shit that we have on the pre-pro uh, uh, demos. We have like Ninja Turtle time because it's in 5-8. So Ninja Turtle time. Ninja, so, or, or like a lot of it is just like one, two, three, one, one, two, three, one, all these weird like dumb just numbers. But sure. we want to find what's like satisfying rhythmically. And we spend weeks, weeks, maybe even months on that. Um, and then we, uh, our vocalist takes that and he locks himself away in his, in his apartment for like three weeks at a time. He'll, he'll be like, I'm not jamming. I, I'm going to be there. I'm not, my phone isn't going to be on most of the time. I'm going to be in my room writing. And, and then he takes all that stuff and tweaks it and comes up with these weird, you know, uh, acid fucking flashback nightmare scape lyrics that, they all relate to each other. It's all part of a huge concept. And um, yeah, I, we, not that any other band that, that is a successful band necessarily phones anything in, but I feel like we put in uh, a lot of work into every single part. And, and honestly, none of us would ever change that. We need to put that fucking time in. Otherwise, we'll be bummed out in a few years. Yeah. You know. Well, I mean... It, it reflects in a genre where, I mean, again, I've been listening to this stuff for 30 fucking years. It takes a lot for me to like notice, you know, especially technical death metal. Um, I mean, I, I think actually, I think where I discovered Archspire was, I don't know if it's like a vocal playthrough or whatever you call it, but it was like maybe what, 2014 or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, he did one and I was, that's what really stood out to me. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Kind of the vocal gymnastics that, I mean, now with deathcore and stuff, people do that maybe more. But back then, I mean, there was, wasn't anybody doing that kind of stuff. Yeah, I, I think that when you said earlier that guitar is the most, most important for death metal, uh, do you find that that's something that you, like, is that is that a true, for you, that's a true statement? Guitar is the most for important For me, thing. no. Okay. Um, but for, <clears throat> I know just from talking to people that the vast majority of metal listeners do not really care about vocals, consciously anyway. Mm. Um, they always mention the riffs. That's That's what matters to them. For me personally, I care more about vocals than anything else because I have more of a pop ear, um, followed by drums. Right. Uh, so guitars would be the least important thing to me personally. But mm -hmm. speaking for listeners in general, I know that it's guitars. I, I think that I consciously think that, anyway. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 uh, yeah. I appreciate that. The um, the thing about the vocals, man, is I can write the sickest lead, the sickest riffs. And I don't, but I could if I was somebody else, but I try. And they don't, it doesn't have the vowel sound the, that vocals do. It doesn't have right. the, the, it's like a primal something in our brains that is Absolutely. recognizing that as something that they are a part of and they can relate to. And they, and, and, you know, obviously every, anybody who's watching this, uh, you, if you like heavy music right now, you're familiar with Lorna Shore and they are crushing because they have an extremely dynamic vocalist who writes great stuff. They're taking lots of risks in the music. I find they're doing, um, you know, I went, I went through as to the hellfire, right? To the hellfire. Mm -hmm. So that video, 25 million views or whatever, crazy. Awesome. The most replayed part in YouTube is, these just not so animal noises yep. that he's doing at the end where they take a breakdown and they slow it down so slow. The meta breakdown. So yeah, exactly. So many long extended gaps where there's just nothing. And the, if you've ever, are you familiar with the Simpsons? So early on in the Simpsons, the Lisa goes to a jazz club and, um, 
uh, she's like, oh, you have to listen to the notes that they're not playing. And then somebody's like, I could do that at home. But um, because they hated it. But the, the point is true. Like, man, those silences and breaks and, and gaps, they show you what parts are important. When you see a band that's full on all the time, 100%, no gaps, no silences, it, y- your brain doesn't know what to do with it. You know, yeah. and, and that's ironic coming from me uh, playing in a band who plays full on as much as possible. But we do know, we try to figure out where the best part to put those breaks and those gaps so that people know what the fuck they're listening to. I mean, I think like your drummer plays with a lot of dynamics, which is another thing that's very rare in your genre. Mm. Like, yeah, he plays fast as shit pretty much all the time. But even within that context, there are actually a lot of dynamics. Yeah, he does like some cool snare drags and some yeah. like interesting ideas and um yeah, it's it it's just a it's a product of what happens when you uh when you take uh five people and you focus on only one thing for that long. You know, it, you you really and one of the issues with being this far into our career now, we're now we're writing album 5. Um the uh the issue at first was we can't be derivative of other bands. So we write an album. We say, that sounds too much like this band. That, whatever. Second album. Okay, so again, let's level up. Can't be too ter- derivative of other bands. Third album. Okay, so now we can't be derivative of ourselves. <laughs> and that's tougher. And now we're in album five, and now it's really tough because are we too formulaic? Do we have a career of doing songs that have the same samey kind of feel? Are we a- a- navigating that and navigating not sounding like other bands, uh, which may or may not get easier as time goes on because you kind of maybe I mean, stop. I think like part of the reason why people love Necrophages so much is because they came, they destroyed everyone's brain, and then they left. It's Seinfeld, man. It's like the Seinfeld didn't really overstay its welcome. It crushed, right. and then and then they dipped. You know, they didn't do. I think they did one season without Larry David, and and it was still a great season. And then they dipped. It's. I think it's amazing to give people less than what they think they want when it comes to music. My favorite. Uh, when I was a teenager, mm-hmm. I loved Dillinger Escape Plan, and the Under the Running Boards EP. Uh, uh, I think it's four songs or whatever. One of the songs insane craziness for the entire song and then it busts out with like a four second in like amazing beautiful melody and you're like what the fuck is this and then it never plays it ever again Mm -hmm. i still think about that i go like man that's the shit that people they they don't know they want that i we write music from the perspective of let's write an album where somebody listens to it front to back they get to the end and they go fuck i gotta listen to it again it's not too long we're not overstaying our welcome 32 minutes in, it ends. You go, holy shit, what was that? It was, it's over? I got to listen to it one more time. And you get the repeat lessons, and that's where you really develop hardcore fans. So would you ever consider doing some sort of a crazy stylistic curveball with either a whole album or a song, like play a slow, sludgy you know, ballad or some shit? No. No. Okay. So you so you've set very narrow constraints for yourselves as so well. So narrow. You, so you're, you're narrow. really playing on hard mode. Yes, it is tough. It is tough to do it. And and I think that most bands when they get older, um, they soften, right? So erections. No. Uh, well, I mean that too. But the uh, everything softens. So um, so we are actively trying to fight against that, and we. It's tough because you you have it's like you have infinite ideas in your brain to pull out and sometimes you pull out more of one thing than another and i feel like you have to really keep yourself in check like i gotta pull more from this bag than this bag because this one is cool and i really like it but it's too it doesn't have the edge that we that we still need um uh you you can't rest on your laurels when it comes to this kind of stuff you need to be like let's let's keep let's act like a younger band. What would a younger band do here? Would they care about melodic big sections that are, you know, like beautiful and I mean, or would they, would they just blast through this section and just make it aggressive and fun and, you know, and so really trying to stay in that direction. It's a constant balancing act, but uh, I, it's I really hope, yeah. hard to like stay. I'll use the word naive, but it's, it's hard to stay in that, space that you might have had when you were younger when you sort of let yourself do what 
ever you wanted, if that makes sense. And the older yeah. you get and the more you know about how to do things the right way, in a lot of ways, I think that inhibits creativity. Oh, dude. Yeah. I mean, like you said, you, you, you narrow the constraints and, and what narrows it even more is, um, we have a rule in our band where it's basically a series of five filters. So if we are playing a riff and our drummer, Spencer loves it, vocalist, Ollie loves it. I love it. Jared, the bassist loves it. Toby's not as into it. Then we investigate. We say, why are you not into it? Okay. Well, I don't really like, okay. If you're really not into it, we don't play it. So you didn't like it, we do not play it. And, and these filters, all of us have to be stoked because we feel like if all of us are stoked, because we come from really kind of different backgrounds. Jared's, uh, you know, our bass player came from uh, jazz. Uh, a j- he loves death metal and metal and kind of stuff, but he came from heavy jazz uh, education and has a degree in jazz. I, I loved prog music when I was younger, uh, dream theater, uh, uh, you know, um, I loved Opeth. I love. I loved Tool. You know, yeah, I loved you all somehow lost your virginity. Amazing. <laughs> well, I mean, you, there's no proof that I lost still my virginity. T- yeah. so. still, well, you're on your way. <laughs> um, our drummer Spencer loves cryptopsy, extreme uh, immolation, all that kind of stuff. Um, all yeah, I don't know what he loves. Uh, he loves rap. You know, a lot of rap. That makes um, sense. Toby loves brutal, slamming death metal, and and all that kind of stuff. The filters, you know, they get rid of all the trash. And, and sometimes we have trash. I don't get how bands can have a single writing, a, pers- a single person that writes. I don't understand how bands can do that. Well, in a lot of cases, it's because the band isn't really a band. It's That's right. one or two people with, you know, essentially session musicians. That's right. Yeah. That That's, aren't That's called true. session musicians, like right. the bass operator, <laughs> you know? And so you got it, which there's nothing wrong with that necessarily, but- no. To do things the way that you're describing it, you got to have a room full of A players. You can't have any dead weight in there with bad taste or they're just going to water it down. And then you get designed by committee, which sucks. You got to have like nobody but killers in the room for that process to work. I, I think one thing that we do that's interesting is basically I bring in a riff and, uh, Ollie, Ollie and Spencer in a way they play as the audience. Because Spencer doesn't know anything about guitar. Ollie doesn't know anything about guitar. They, they both, Jared, Toby, and I all are guitar players. Jared's a bass player now, but he was a guitar player for as long as I've been playing. And he's a killer guitar player, which fucking frustrates me. Um, yeah, but, uh, but they play as these people that, if they're listening to it, and they say, yeah, it sounds okay, but I'm sitting there ripping this crazy riff that has this insane technique that I've never seen anybody do or whatever, or I think it's so cool, but I'm probably wrong. And they go, yeah, it looks cool, but does it sound good? And I go, you're right. You know what? It looks cool and it feels cool, but man, the most important thing is not how crazy is the riff. It's like, what is the sound? So, so having people that kind of play the audience is really important. Um, we actually used to have our friends come in, in, into the jam spot pretty much every rehearsal, every writing session, and just have them sit there and give us their ideas. And they're not even always metalheads. They're just friends of the band that we know. And they come in like, oh, you, should, you guys should play that part again. It's really cool. Like, what? That part sucks. Like, no, no, that part's sick. That's the best part of the song. Like, oh, shit. Like, the perspective is just all, it's all if that's, that's happened before. And, and we double apart and we realized it was a great idea. I think that is so valuable. Like, back when I... I used to work in an industrial design agency and we did whatever, like a hundred sketches for this one product concept we were working on. And we asked the receptionist to come in uh, and we're like, Tracy, what do you think about these? And she looks for like a minute and we were like very proud of this. Right. She looks around for a minute and she's like, well, they all kind of look the same, don't they? What, <laughs> what's the difference? And we just looked at each other and we're like, fuck, she's right. <laughs> a frustrating experience. But you know, if you want to be, if you want to do your best work, you got to be willing to get kicked in the balls like that. It, it's like y- you would think that writing music would get easier, but it, it only gets harder. It, it only gets more difficult. I find that maybe you have better tools, but your, your expectations go up a lot. And I feel like they don't track with each other. You have better tools. You rely, like now we're relying on, relying on um, recording stuff at the jam spot. So we have an idea, we track it. And we can listen to it in real so time. So do you like track it, track it, or just like a demo? 
Yeah, we just demo it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we just demo it and 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 you can hear it back. We have everything mic'd up and it's awesome. But we also want to write better music, much, much better music than we did two albums ago. So we go, yeah, yeah, sure, we're we're faster at this one thing, but that doesn't make the ideas come any quicker or it doesn't make the ideas that we have any better. Is there any like specific thing that you can think of that if you could like sprinkle magic creativity dust on yourselves, like is there something in your head that you haven't been able to get out yet? Like sonically? Uh, I, I love classical music. Um, I'm a big, like uh Ravel and WC and Bach and Mozart and I, I, I'm a Rachmaninoff. I'm, I'm big fans, Chopin, all this stuff. And, what what classical music or concert music generally has, whether it's impressionist or or classical or whatever era, is they'll have a lot of, um, they'll have some awesome dark minor melody that's just amazing, but then they'll have this bright, happy thing, and it makes the the dark thing sound darker. And I don't want the second thing. I don't want the happy thing. I don't want it. But it's a necessary, even though it's kind of. <laughs> kind of ironic it's a necessary evil because right. you need some brightness to highlight the darkness right right um and there's music in uh mozart or uh mozart's uh i wouldn't say discography but uh his work, list of works or bach where they have just these uh, you know dark amazing movements that make you like almost want to cry when you hear six notes in a row right and it, and it's set they start you on a path from the beginning of the piece and they take you in, you know, bar 60, that's where it pays off and you go, oh my God. And, and I oftentimes think that writing music, you know, if it was just a matter of, okay, so I have, um, I have a, a, a left to right, I have all my notes, I'm going to plug them in. Okay, this one to this one. Does that one sound good? Yeah, it sounds okay. Okay, this one to this one. Okay, that one sounds better. Okay, so the next one, what's the next one? Uh, up, no, down, okay, down. Okay, those three sound good. It, it, it doesn't really work like that. You have to experience it all in context for right. you to really get it. And, and I, I touched just with a, a part that I wrote for a song that we have called Dark, A Dark Horizontal on our uh, second last album, so Relentless Mutation. Um, there's a part in it that just has really dark, these octave melodies that I go down that are harmonized in a cool way. And there's a bit of a key change in there somewhere. And it just, it's this dark kind of melody. And, and I, I really like it. I think it was probably, probably one of my favorite things I've ever written. It's not extremely difficult or complex or whatever, but I just barely touched this, oh man, that part makes me, gives me shivers and makes me want to cry just hearing that one. I just barely touched it. And I'm always trying to chase that sort of, um, you know, I'm going to play three chords in a row and the third one's going to make you like want to fall over. It, it, it is a simple idea, but just in context, those three chords, that's what makes it. And, and uh, it's sort of like a, like a high that you're chasing. It's like, man, I got, a, I got something. If I didn't, if I felt like I didn't have anything left, then I wouldn't be in the band. But I got, well, I got something left. Going back to your, uh, you, you mentioned Unholy earlier. Um, I think that's a song that has that same kind of movement and like, yes. you know, I, I, almost like narrative development over time. Um, to play devil's advocate, my initial thought to what you're saying is, well, it, as long as you're playing technical death metal, it, d is it even possible, given the constraints of technical death metal, to do what you're saying. And I, I'm sure that it is, but like my initial response was like, man, that, I, I don't even know if that's possible. Yeah. Well, that's, it, it's, um, it's the layers that you put in that I feel make it possible. It's the, it's the complexity of not necessarily the riffs because we could write the most complex riffs ever with time signature changes, all that kind of stuff. And, and, and you know, tempo changes and make it constantly changing keys. And it would be really you know, polyrhythmic stuff, but that's not really what hooks people right. generally. And so looking for the, the, you write a section and you're like, this is pretty good. It's 90% done. The 10% is obviously, I mean, I think it's a pretty well-known thing. That last 10% is, is the hardest thing to write. And it's also the most, most important where you get, you feel the love of the person that created this thing, you feel the love in that 10%. You go, they didn't just go, eh, it's done. 
They, mm-hmm. they put in these extra little things, whether it's a melody in the background deep in there to create more of a, uh, a wash of something or a, a callback. I love callbacks. You have a riff at the beginning of the song and then you hear a, another riff later in the song and in the background, there's a callback to that. Th- and and you, you know from the very start, this song is part of um, a contiguous sort of, this is something that, somebody really has a lot of passion for and they, and they knew that a few people are going to listen to it a hundred times. And on the hundredth listen, you'll go, oh, fuck, what the hell is, I didn't even notice that. And I get that with a band. Um, uh, I get that with when, when planetary duality from the faces yes. came out, fuck man, that album fucking rules or a band called blotted science. They put oh, out a, an album called machinations of dementia and that album, God, it's got some stuff in there. That's just, Man, they really, they, he didn't just sit down and write a solo. He spent weeks or months fixing every single note so that it's perfect and it leads perfectly in the next one. And I so respect that. I would say Ron Jarzombek is probably not right in the head. Um, and uh, Agreed. it shows in his music in the best way. Agreed. That guy is a, is a literal mad genius when it comes yes. to music. Yeah. Unbelievable. Uh, well, what you're talking about, I would say... Like I've been working with producers and stuff for about 10 years now and, and musicians, but mostly producers. But the, the main thing that I really take away from that 10 years is exactly what you're talking about is that I learned that my standards were just not even in the same universe as the standards of people who do cr- truly great work. Like what I thought was done was like not even halfway done by their right. standards that I'd be like, Oh, that sounds good. And they look at me like, are you fucking stupid? Like, do you, do you have any examples of that? Uh, I mean, everybody that we've had on nail the mix, but ale is a really good example of that. Oh yeah. You know I mean, he's just ruthless when it comes. I mean, he's such a fucking snob when it comes to music <laughs> for one. And he's just ruthless about it. Yeah. Um, but that's what it takes. I mean, Andrew Wade is another example of that. I mean, these kind of people that will, you know, just th- no, the harmonies aren't there yet. Like, I don't, I don't know what they're going, like, I don't know what they need to be, but they're, they're not there yet. And we're going to keep trying stuff until we get there. And yeah, probably, you know, the average listener is not going to notice it, but it needs to be great. It I, needs to be right. And we're I not have- going to stop until it's there. I have a question about that for, and I want to know your opinion. Where do you think that stuff comes from? Where do you think somebody that goes, that's not done yet. Where do you think they get that? Where's that emotion or that feeling or that decision? Where does that come from in their life? Like, I mean, my personal opinion is that it's, um, I think you're born with it. Um, because I have that same kind of trait in other, not with me. I'm not musically talented. Um, but I have that same trait in other things. Um, and more like kind of like analytical things. Um, and I was just born that way. I've been that way my whole life. Like the way I would approach, like for me, it's like, if I would read like an academic paper, I don't read the fucking abstract and then tap out. Like most people do. I read the entire thing, including the methods. And I read every assumption that they made for every piece of the methods. And I think it through and I go, wait a minute. They assumed this, this, and this, that doesn't, that, that sounds a little bit sketchy. You know, and right. uh, I'm sure I've been told by people that that's very exhausting <laughs> to, to be around, which I totally understand because I'm sure it is, but I, I can't help it. That's the way my brain works. I, I do. I, I know the feeling. I mean, obviously with music, I, I, I obsess and I make sure that it's as perfect as I can possibly make it. That being said, I also do leave room for uh, a, a producer to, to put their expertise because I know that's another filter. And, and when you have a really good producer that you trust and they go, that riff needs to change a little bit. You take their word and you go, you know what? I think you're right. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize it, but, and, and that's why I don't personally understand single, um, uh, composer bands. But, um, I find that same thought process happens a lot in video editing for me, video Mm -hmm. editing. I obsess and I go over something over and over it. And I go, is the comedic timing of this one four second part? Good. Does a joke land? Does the music cut too soon? It'll be like frame play it back. Okay. Change one frame, play it back. Okay. Uh, seriously, like, you know, a single part will take me 20 minutes sometimes. Cause I know there's something in there and I just need to chisel it away. Well, that's the difference between you and me. <laughs> well, I totally video? half-assed. Well, I have an editor now that edits oh, my stuff. So nice. he, he does a good job, but like what I realized 
from it may be different for your people because you're a musician. Um, but for what I realized for my people is that a lot of people just listen to my videos. Oh yeah. And I was like, Oh, why am I, um, putting in all this effort into these edits that a lot of people don't even watch, or even if they do have the video on they're on their phone or something. So I started basically, I don't want to say half-assing the edit, but I didn't make it, I didn't put in more effort than I felt like I needed to. And I didn't notice any difference whatsoever, but that's because I am not emotionally attached to video editing. Mm. You know, like it doesn't scratch a creative itch from editing does not scratch creative itch for me. Oh, what I care okay. about is like ideas. So like right. for me, I would get very irritated if I was trying to make um, some sort of a point about, for example, like user behavior on our product and someone was sort of hand waving and saying it's OK that we don't know why people do X, Y or Z. I'd be like, no, it's not fucking OK. We need to know why they do it. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, uh, yeah, so we, yeah, we all have, you know, we apply that in different places, I guess. But I think the common thread and not that I'm saying I'm great because I don't think I am, but you know, of people who are great, that like insistence on the highest standard, I think, is a universal. The uh, the thing that you're doing that you mentioned with uh, with video editing, you, you say, you know what? Why am I putting the extra time into this? Blah blah blah. But you could also put that to you're so focused on you know giving people a, a great product that you go, you know what? It's not worth it for me to spend the time and give less product or less content or yes. tire myself out because you know that the content is mo more, most important and you know what your audience is doing. Yes. So for you, that was, I mean, it is kind of a similar move. And, and I know that feeling too, when you go, you're putting so much time in something and you realize, isn't a candid feel more uh, relatable to the audience yeah, for like this it's one not, thing? I want it to be the best thing it can be. Yeah. But... I realized that the visuals, for me at least, are not actually the important part of what makes it the best thing it can be. Right, yeah, exactly, yeah. So you know deeply what it is and, and you, want to, you want to deliver that. So that's just another side of this, you know, craziness that we have. Yeah, well, let's, let's talk about YouTube uh, for a little bit. You, you've been doing it for uh, maybe a year or something now, or a little bit more, maybe? I actually started before the pandemic. I, in 2019, I was doing a series oh, okay. where, where I thought, you know what, I'm, pract I'm practicing a lot of guitar at home, but I wish I was practicing more. And, and as a guitar player, I can always practice more. Um, people ask me how many hours a day I play, and I'm like, honestly, on a Monday, it might be five hours. On a Tuesday, it might be zero. Like, it really isn't a, a daily thing. And when it is, I go hard. When I don't, I take a break because I'm a human being and it's my job to play guitar. So I need to have a balance. But uh, in 2019, I thought, you know, what would be great is if I could monetize my practice, which is, is good. It's good to do. I like making money. I don't, uh, I don't like not having money. So let's have more money. Um, and so I, I started thinking, let's, I'm going to film myself learning this really difficult thing. And so I did that and some people kind of liked it. I started doing it more and more and more and realized just, you know, more about video editing. I had done a bit, well, I'd done quite a bit up until then, but I was really getting used to being more on camera and, and that's a whole skill that you learn yeah. while you're doing this stuff and not being embarrassed to see your own face on camera. Um, oh, or I not, still hate it. Not finding your not own as jokes. Much as I used to. Well, you find your own jokes, jokes cringy, I imagine too, at some point you're like, why the fuck did no. I say that? <laughs> yeah, right, Never. Right, right, right. Yeah. So I, I started doing that and then I started partnering with this with this company called Sheet Happens Publishing, uh, which is a great tab, um, uh, guitar tab, uh, bass tab uh, uh, company. They're awesome. They're from Canada. And so they started helping me a little bit. And, and then through the pandemic, uh, my wife and I we were sitting there one day and we're like, you know, what? it's kind of fun to play guitar together because she plays guitar. Uh, and so she's like, you know what we should do? We should learn a riff together. And I said, no, that's stupid. You're an idiot. No, I didn't see it. Well, maybe I did see it. I don't know. But whatever I said, hurtful words, she's like, you know what? We're going to film it and I will edit it. So she offered to edit it. I was like, you know what? Okay. No one's going to want to watch it because you have two guitar players playing wrong notes over top of each other. Why would that sound good? No, it's not going to work. And we did one video and people really liked it. It was unedited. It was really long, 45 minutes long, really long. But people really liked it. It was probably out of focus. The audio sounded bad. So we did it again, and I said, you know, this is fun. You could tweak it every time. And so we've done now, I, I don't know, 70 videos together, 80 videos together. I didn't together. realize you'd been doing it for that long. I guess I'm just so old that time just blurs together. <laughs> Dude, the, we all lost years there, so that's yeah. fine. Um, 
but as that went on, I just found, I found a stride. I found my, my groove in editing and adding in really stupid, dumb jokes that made me laugh. I, I took all inspiration from the Simpsons season three to seven. That's where I, all my humor is from. They have the, or, or, you know, early South park, all that shit. They have these quick things. It's dense with jokes. It's dense mm-hmm. with material. And, and it, and it, um, it rewards people who pay attention and it, like arrested development, a, a great example of a show that if you paid attention and maybe they went a bit too far in the, in that direction, but they, they packed it so full of stuff that it's so infinitely rewatchable because it's just dense. And, and I love that. And I love landing jokes. And so I got more and more into that. And now, you know, we're doing, we did videos with, um, we did a video with Devin Townsend, uh, Matt Heafy from Trivium. We did, uh, Ola England came on, um, uh, David Davidson from Revocation. Uh, I, I, we've had a lot of great uh, guitar players on there. And it's just been such a joy to kind of have a really cool project with my wife to do like that as well. And we've both gotten so much better on camera now. It's just, it's just a great skill to have, you know? Yeah, you, you guys are great. And I, I wonder, like, I feel like in your genre, there aren't a lot of um, personalities. And in, in other words, like, you know, in, in death metal in general, I feel like people don't really, they're not into like social media and like they're, you know, they may be big personalities if you know them personally, but there aren't a lot of people that are putting themselves out there like you do, especially in, you know, like uh, such a fun, accessible kind of way. And uh, I wonder how much YouTube has had, I mean, you guys are certainly the breakout band in your genre more successful than I would have ever dreamed that a band that sounds like Arch by Art could be. Yes. I mean, you guys, you guys won the Juno, right? We won uh, the best heavy album of 2020, uh, 2020. It was this year. Our album came out last year, but yeah, it was 2020, which is like a Canadian Grammy. Yeah. You know, you're in the top 100 or something on billboard, which for your genre is insane. Yeah. And, and I wonder how much do you think YouTube has played a role in that? I, we just did a tour over the summer uh tech trek uh five so our headline branded headliner tour so the fifth one it through the states and on the big shows i would have 60 70 people come up to me and say i love your youtube channel uh on the small shows uh still a dozen you know i i dude it was overwhelming i i actually i i i knew that there was support and obviously the U S is a big market for us, but I didn't really cr- quite realize how much support there was. And, and when you hear people say, you know, your videos got me through blah, blah, blah. The pandemic was hard, but I actually, you know, managed to start playing guitar because I started watching your videos. You know, it, it's, it's really amazing. You're right. There's not a lot of people in the genre that really put themselves out there um, quite that much. I, I think, I think it's a really tough thing to, to do. And I, man, it was tough for me. I started doing instructional stuff. Um, 20, I mean, I started teaching in 20, uh, 2009. Uh, and then I was teaching full time for a while, but I did a few kind of instructional videos and I fucking, I really wanted to get good at it, but man, I was so embarrassed. I thought I was so stupid. The stuff I was saying was just so it's been said before. Why would I talk yeah. about modes? Cause scales picking, you could just go find better content. So there was a, a trick that I basically, you know, it's not really even a trick. It's just the facts is when you are sitting there talking about something and you, in your field of expertise, which as a musician, we, uh, we, you know, if you've been playing for a decent amount of time, uh, there's not really much of a difference between the expertise in music and the expertise in, uh, being a mechanic. Uh, right. one serves a fundamental purpose. The other one also serves being entertained as fundamental in being a human. Um, but for some reason, we undervalue ourselves as musicians. We go, you know what, people, nobody wants to hear me talk about that. Uh, we don't deserve that much money as a band. We'll never, get, we'll never make money playing in this band. It's like, why? Why yeah. not? Tons of bands do it. So, um, so for me, I, I, as I was doing instructional stuff, getting more comfortable, I realized like, yeah, this stuff, people have probably talked about it. People have probably talked about it better than I have. They've taught it better than me. They know more about it than I do. But there's also now 8 billion people in the world. And for you to expect to put out something and have it be singular, unique, the only time anybody's ever brought it up is crazy. Yeah, that's delusional. So letting the perfect be the enemy of the good there is just so self-defeating. So just 
do it and just get better at it and and embrace the fact that you think you're bad on camera and and if you do it a hundred times 200 times i mean you know streaming all the time videos it, you just develop a a comfort with it and and uh, man it's so beneficial to being a full-time musician in 2022 uh because man the music industry is not what it was when you could sell records you know uh, we make we make royalties when it comes to selling music but we're not making, you know, 80s money, 90s money. We're making a fraction or whatever. We don't have handlers. We don't have managers. We don't have excess money at labels. You know, we're, we're surviving off of a thing that we built and we built most of it ourselves with the help of funding and, and, uh, and guidance from a, music, a record label. But I mean, it's our thing and, and it yeah. didn't come from anybody else. And you gotta, you gotta be your own self-advocate. You gotta push for yourself there and, and, uh, and kind of branch out, I think. So I don't know. It, it's, it's been great. I feel like people have found the band through my YouTube channel, which is just awesome. Every once in a while I'll post who here knew about Archfire before you watch these videos. And I got tons of people being like, I'd never heard of your band. I just saw you play guitar. And then I, I realized you were in a band at one point, checked it out. Wow. I really liked it. That's Lots the power of, of YouTube. People. Dude, that's it. And you know, I think it's not a coincidence that um, we were talking about vocals before. I don't think it's a coincidence that the breakout bands in any subgenre of metal generally tend to have um, very good like vocals. I also don't think it's a coincidence that the breakout bands in a lot of these genres uh, also put themselves out there and in, 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 in put their personalities out. For example, we'll talk about Lorna Shore again. Like, I mean, Lorna Shore has been a good band for a long time. Oh, yeah. Like musically, they've been a really fucking good band pretty much since the beginning. Yes. Um, but what they didn't have is a front man, you know, that had the kind of personality that makes people feel welcome and, you know, feel like it's going to be a good time and stuff. Uh, and once they got that with Will, they were always good musically. They just needed that front man who also happens to be an extremely fucking good vocalist. There you go. Mm. I draw a lot of parallels with Archspire. In this case, I think in a lot of ways, you're kind of the front man of the band, even though you're not the vocalist. Um, and I think, you know, putting yourself out there at, and building up your personality and, you know, like you hanging out with your, it feels like when I'm watching those videos, it feels like I'm hanging out with you guys as friends. And I think that that has like a, a, a significant role in your success. The, uh, yeah, the thing with Lauren Shore is they've been, they've been amazing since the beginning. You're right. And yeah, the, the, the comfort that you get. And I, I always, I've, I've, I've talked to people about this before is, uh, there, we are in such a subjective art form, all art is subjective, but the, the, the fact that we are putting out, um, uh, media, we're putting out entertainment that's musical, but it also, you can't divorce that from the people that write it. And right. now we're living in a time where if you know the music, you generally go, okay, well, you know, like I wonder, I'll follow them on Instagram, all that kind of stuff. And if you get a good vibe from them and you get, and you love the music, then it like cements it and becomes greater than something. Yep. And, and with, yeah, I mean with Will uh, or with people that enjoy uh, my and my wife's content. Uh, yeah. It just like cements, uh, the whole project together in a way that, yeah, you wouldn't get normally. There's amazing bands that don't, that don't do um, any of that, that don't do the kind of stuff that, that, uh, that I do or more sure or whatever. And they're amazing and they'll stay lesser known. Not say that's the only way to go because man, right. there's amazing bands that don't have any social media and that's its own thing. That's you go, you know, that. there's it's, it's even, it, yeah. For some people, they prefer that. Like, you, you know, that's the kind of person that I want. I don't want, right. or, or this is this this musician is an enigma. I need to know more. I need to go see them live every single time. I need to buy their shirts. I I want to be closer to this thing uh, because it's it's all you know. It's you can't divorce the two: the person that made the music and, and the music itself. So. Another example of that you know what made me finally really like Ghost is um, I I always thought the music was fine, but I was like, eh, you know, it's whatever. Yeah. Uh, I watched a skit. Maybe it was like a month ago or something. Um, where they're like driving, they're like doing this road trip, like Tobias is driving, you know, and he's got, I guess they're char characters that people might know, whatever, but right. you know, and it's hilarious. I had no idea that he was so funny. And, oh. Um, oh, okay. After watching that skit, I was like, holy shit, this is hilarious. 
I had no idea that they were like this. And next time I listen to the music, there's just something in your brain that flips. Yeah. Made me go, okay, you know what? Actually, this band's pretty good. Maybe yeah. maybe I need to give them another shot. Yeah, Mastodon did that as well. I mean, uh, they they have funny skits and they would do, you know, their music videos are fun. And I think that... I think that there's a time and a place for a band that takes themselves seriously. Yeah. Uh, a band like Tool generally takes themselves pretty seriously. Uh, you know, Maynard, gener- I mean, when I saw them in grade nine, uh, one of my first concerts ever, uh, he was like behind, he was like a silhouette the entire time. He was like behind something, you know, he's like so separated from the audience. You can't even see his physical body. You only see the light that he's casting on the screen. Um, <clears throat> but um, I don't remember what I was going to say. It was a crazy thing to see. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a, I mean, there's a place for everything, I guess, yeah, is the yeah, point. Yeah. But yeah. I do think that, you know, I talk to a lot of people in bands that are kind of wondering, like, how do we, you know, how do we get anybody to give a shit about us? And yeah, right. I think, you know, whatever the authentic version of you is, put it out there is what I think. Yeah. You know, don't, if you're not a goofy person, don't be goofy, you know, um, but uh, I guess, you know, there's this sort of idea, I think, in metal that fun and metal don't go together and that's that's just not true dude number one thing we we made this switch recently on this last tour we said you know what people love going to is parties yeah our our show should be a fucking party we should every night it should be like you can't think about it like okay well yeah it's it's four bands okay so we'll build the package musical people will like but like yeah we'll we'll rely on that it's it's the it's the norm it's you know people are expecting a show so we'll give them a show uh when we were through uh europe last in 2019 uh we brought on our, our really good friend uh brett from revocation he did merchandise for us who so was selling merch but uh it was near christmas time and so we thought you know what would be fun is if he was santa on stage and he would throw out gifts into the audience so he dressed like Santa. He had a sign that said mosh faster. And we market ourselves as the fastest band in the world. So we have to have the fastest mosh pit in the world. So mm-hmm. mosh faster. And then he, we would wrap big presents full of just trash that we found in the back in the green room, just like, like a empty beer bottle, like some candy, like just like not nothing. It's just shit. But you throw this thing in the audience and it would become people would just like rip it apart and 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 they're part of this thing that's going on because it's a it's different it's it's a right. fun time we're playing extreme death metal music but we're wearing uh swimming shorts uh swimming trunks on stage really short shorts or um you know we uh Gotta be careful there <laughs> that's true yeah that's true yeah yeah um one thing that we started doing recently is uh if you are the fastest person in the mosh pit, then our vocalist Ollie will throw out a free t-shirt. But the t-shirts are just, we go to Walmart and we buy triple XL <laughs> white shirts and we write like, one of my favorites is, uh, I'm with Stinky with an arrow pointing down. That Which was, is way cooler than getting a free real uh, shirt. Or, or yes, or Toby would recreate the album cover in like really shitty marker right. and our, our spars all spelled wrong. And, and that's a unique piece of uh, merchandise you'll never get. But, but it should be fun, dude. Right. Like, you know, it's that's why people are going. They're not going to be bummed out. They're not going to see serious band. Sometimes people want that, but with our music, I feel like it's a benefit to be like, no, no, no. Come have fun with us. This is going to be fun. Well, that is a good uh, note for us to end it on. I'm going to go have some dinner, but uh, just congratulations and everything. I think it is just really fucking cool for you guys to you know, achieve what you guys have without making any compromises, I think is fucking awesome. So uh, I'm excited for you guys, excited to see what's next. And uh, I will catch you guys next time. Come through Seattle. Thanks, buddy. All right. Take care.